Welcome to Unbreakable Spirit, stories of inspiring and thriving with Jennifer Seven, co-author of a book that is part of the Sisterhood Folios, a number one international bestseller. This is a podcast about real women who've overcome tremendous obstacles and come out on the other side to thrive. Whether their hardships were financial, relational, or health, these women dug deep and found the light out of the dark to rise from the ashes, to find the ability to forgive, to love, and to live an authentic, joyful life. Now, here is your host, Jennifer Seven. Hello, everyone. We are excited to have you here for our Unbreakable Spirit podcast. And I have a very special guest today. I am so excited to have Loriana Hernandez Aldama here. And Loriana is an Emmy Award winning former news anchor and national medical reporter turned two times cancer survivor. She is an inspiration and an inspirational speaker. She's had a diagnosis of AML leukemia. And in an instant, Loriana went from telling everyone's story to actually becoming the story. So welcome, Loriana. I'm Thank glad you. to have you here. A little bit more about Loriana. On the fifth anniversary of surviving her AML leukemia and a bone marrow transplant, she got, as she puts it, two unexpected gifts, breast cancer and the discovery of a genetic marker, CHIP, a cancer predisposition gene gifted to her in her new DNA. And we'll be talking about what she means by new DNA. Loriana's mission is to improve the patient experience because of everything she's been through, patient compliance and patient outcomes with Armor Up for Life, where she shares her 3P protocol, prepare, present, and prevail to survive illness, a message she learned from her world-renowned oncologist. We all must prepare for illness so we can present well to our medical team so we can ultimately ourselves prevail. Loriana, thank you for being here. And Ah. wow, you have a story. You have a story. Thank you so much for having me. I think we all have stories, but some are different degrees than others. And like I I told you when we speak that sometimes you wonder like, why do I have to punch the time card so much? Like, didn't I already meet the quota for suffering? But sometimes some of us have to go through extra suffering and extra challenges to overcome. We all have challenges, but yes, I feel like some ways, it's been a long road. It has. I put it politely. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, let's go back in time and share with our listeners how it all started, all of this. Well, it started, as you mentioned, I was a news anchor for more than 25 years and a national medical reporter. That was my, it was my dream job. I was living the life. I was the clean eating, green drinking, yoga enthusiast. I told people I had a clean eating show telling everyone what to eat, like, eat this to avoid cancer, do this to avoid cancer, the very cancer I was about to face. Mm. And, and looking back, I mean, I had such an amazing career, an amazing life. Not that I didn't have any problems, but I had, you know, just the daily problems that we all might have in our lives. And I was also in the midst of a fertility treatment at the time of my do- diagnosis to have a second baby. So many of us, we think we're invincible. And that's how I was. Mm-hmm. I was living the life, waking up at what, I don't know if waking up at 1.45 in the morning is living the life <laughs> as I say this, but waking up at 1.45 in the morning, nursing my son, having a nanny show up at three o'clock after have, putting teeny makeup on and flat ironing my hair and getting to work. My husband was living clear across the country because we were climbing the ladder and following our dreams. We were going to do this in separate states. You were a power couple, huh? Right. Power couple. We're invincible. We're going to follow our dreams and our big contracts. And I say this, like looking back, like what in the world were we thinking? So I had had some bone pain and things that kind of came up, but I said, you know what? I probably worked out too hard and, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe I did too many boot camps in, in my career. A lot of times what I would do is I would, when celebrities would come to town, I'd work out with Olympic gold medalists who would come to Austin, Texas, or our football players, or the baseball team, and uh, the Houston Texans to oh show what people did to get fit. And then we, wow. we would go to celebrities' homes and open up the pantry and say, whoa, what do you have in here? So people could see, like, you know, you have to put work into it to stay fit. Like, mm-hmm. it's, 
staying fit. I always have said, even before I had cancer, when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So mm. I was, my mindset was all about getting fit. I didn't have the three P protocol at the time, but, um, but you had all, chosen but was, to live, you were living that lifestyle. You were I was a living that lifestyle. Life. But it was also all when you're on TV and viewers write in and say, oh, that jacket looks a little tight or you know, oh, you're always gosh. under the microscope for everything. Mm-hmm. So it is also about the skinny jeans, mm-hmm. but cancer taught me it's not about the skinny jeans either. So to fast forward, I was living the life and all of a sudden in an instant, I was fighting for my life because I had some bone pain in the middle of the night. I woke up well, middle of the night for me was like 10 o'clock at night hold my arm. It was felt like a truck had rolled over my arm. I called my husband who was holding down his dream job in Bethesda. And I said, I was crying and screaming. And I said, something is happening. And then I said, he's like, well, you need to call in sick to work. And I said, you work in TV. You can't call in sick to work. Like they need me. Who are you calling at one o'clock in the morning to fill your slot at 4.30 in the morning for updates and anchor a morning show. So I went to work, put an ice pack, put icy hot, called people I'd interviewed, like someone to bring their TENS machine, called my acupuncturist. The the reason why I'm sharing this portion is because I ignored so many warning signs because I was so busy focusing on taking care of everybody else, like how to get everybody else fit, how to make everybody else change their lives through diet and exercise. And so I ignored that. And finally, um, it was my fertility doctor, because we were in the midst of a fertility treatment to have a second baby, who said, I want to do some blood work. And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm just tired. And I even had gone to two oncologists prior to that bone pain because I was exhausted, but who's not going to be exhausted waking up at one 45 in the morning. Well, that's interesting though, that you went to an oncologist just because you were tired. Well, something got you there. The, my OBGYN backing up before this bone pain had said, you're something about your blood work looks different. It doesn't look out, completely out of range, but I want you to go see this oncologist because something looks, maybe they would have a little better expertise. Okay. And I went a few months before that bone pain and they said, you're like burning the candle at both ends. You're just tired. You're everywhere. You're at galas. You're at this, you're at that. You're at the, the Alzheimer's walk, the, this walk, the allergy walk, you know, you name it. I was there because I lived really my life to serve others, which was great. It all came back to me when I was sick, everybody else helped me. So it was a blessing. But two oncologists who were very good oncologists had overlooked it too and said, you're just tired. So fast forward after those twice being misdiagnosed, I have a fertility doctor, not an oncologist say, I think you have cancer. And I'm like, you're wrong. You're like, oh my God, right? No way. No way. You've got the wrong person. Remember I'm the clean eating, green drinking, and I tell you what to eat, not to get cancer. Forgetting that we all have genetic markers and also the wheel will fall off the bus. It just, you can eat right and exercise, but if you don't sleep, the wheel's still going to fall off the bus. So my, my fertility doctor said to me, I want you to go get some more blood work. And I went and got blood work and he came to my house and said, I need, and I was like, what are you doing at my house? And he said, I I need to talk to you. And I thought something happened with the baby, with the embryo. He said, I think you have cancer You for leukemia. Oh my gosh. And And was this the infertility doctor? This was the fertility doctor. And I said, you're a fertility doctor. Like I had two oncologists earlier in the year. You're, you stay in your lane. Get out of my house. Get out of my house. And he's the most amazing guy I used. I did fertility to have my, my one and only son, Gabriel. And so he, he said, no, I'm not, we're not going through with this whole thing. I had a due date. So he sent me to get a bone marrow biopsy. So I went to get a bone marrow biopsy. And then with those results, it was confirmed that I had leukemia, AML leukemia, acute myeloid leukemia, and the treatment had not changed in 40 years. So at that time I was stunned and I, I called, that's when I took to social media and said, you know, everyone can complain about what social media is or isn't, but you have to use your network and networking. Isn't just about finding a job. It could be for saving your life. And I, it took a lot for me to go onto social media and say, Hey, I have leukemia And I know I told you all these things to eat, to avoid cancer. And I have cancer. 
And I, I was ashamed and almost thought, well, am I going to hide behind it? And it's okay if you do, because many people have to hide for various reasons behind their illness. Could be their employer, their insurance that they need, or they want to hide it from their kids. And not everyone handles everything the same way. But for me, I said, you know, I have been transparent my entire career and thought that if I went through anything, I would share it with viewers. I shared my fertility problems with viewers, my family's heart disease issues. So I said, I have to share this. And I came clean and said, I feel guilty that I had this show telling you what not to eat. And now I have cancer. I find that kind of amazing. I, I have never thought about having this feeling of shame or guilt over something oh. like that. Here you are living a good life. It's not your fault. And yet have, a little bit of that imposter syndrome, like, yes, it, this is who absolutely. I thought I was, but this is not who I am. Yeah. I thought I, I, when I found out about the leukemia, I said, I have to, how do I make this right with viewers? Like I have built relationships through trust and viewers all over. I had worked in California, all up and down California. I've worked in Dallas and Austin. I've worked at CNN. I've worked on all different networks. So whether you have a favorite network, I've worked at all of them. So you cannot not like me because of one network or the other. I've worked <laughs> at all, most of them, but I also had been a national medical reporter. No matter where I landed locally, I did national medical news. And I said, people trust me. And how, what do I tell them? And I just remembered that you got to keep it real. I tell mm -hmm. what I did as a reporter. The only thing is that as a reporter, they always tell you, don't become the story. No matter how emotional you get, you cannot become the story. The story is who you're reporting on. And I became the story. My story made headlines on other networks, even besides the one that I worked for at the time. And I had to come to terms with, I'm going to be very transparent. And if someone can learn from my story. And what I learned was through social media, I got in with the best oncologist at Johns Hopkins world renowned who knew my mutation, knew my type of AML leukemia. And he said, what you need to get on a plane right now. We have a bed waiting for you. You don't have time to waste. Oh my goodness. I, I wow. That just boom. Yeah. And you know, again, it's why I also advocate, like I love, I try to advocate for more help at, at, um, smaller hospitals, but for me, I feel like the best patient outcome you're going to get is when you're going to go to a multidisciplinary hospital that has a teaching program and you have multiple eyes and ears watching you and learning from you. And so I knew after being misdiagnosed that I'm going to go to Johns Hopkins. I said, I have to leave here, even though I love this state and I have a son to live for at the time he was two and I'm going to get on the plane. But they told me I had to kiss him goodbye and they didn't know when I'd see him again. And oh. to get on that plane, I brought him to the airport with me because my husband was still flying in at the time to meet my best friend, who was also my hairdresser at the airport to get Gabriel. And I literally kissed him goodbye at, at the, when they called my name to get on the plane. And he was screaming, mommy, 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 echoing down the jetway. And it haunts me. The PTSD that I have is, it's traumatizing. I still, I seek help for it. I speak about the PTSD uh, because psycho-oncology is huge and I will never forget his voice. It's piercing to me. I, I, I still get emotional when I think of, no matter how, I, he's nine now, that was seven years ago. I still cry thinking of that voice. Of Why at that point where they think you might not see him again? Because the, for leukemia, AML leukemia, it's mostly inpatient. And it's one in four people make it. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm glad you asked that because every we are doing better overall in cancer research, but they're, not all of them have the same funding. And AML leukemia, even though there are a number of organizations raising money for blood cancers, there's more funding for breast cancer per se because it affects more people than blood cancers. And the numbers were not good. And having been a reporter and the irony of all ironies is before I was diagnosed with leukemia, I used to raise money and go to galas for the Leukemia Lymphoma Society. But it's different when you're mm -hmm. on stage and it's another good cause and you're there because it's a good cause, but you're also there because it's a great event. You're putting on your dress and it's a gown. And But it's a totally different story when you realize that the money that you're asking people to donate could fund your own fight. 
So, so your life turned literally upside down incredibly fast. Upside down in an instant. I, I went from living the life to fighting for my life, kissing my son goodbye in the airport, not knowing if I would ever see him again. And now, you barely, I, you, you didn't even have time to really do a transition with your husband. It was like, you get here, no, you take him, I'm out. And then I we'll didn't even figure yeah, it out. I, he had to, so my hairdresser, I keep seeing my hair. I love him. He's my, one of my best friends, but my friend Craig had to hold Gabriel in the airport and then meet my husband with Gabriel, who was going to take another flight to Atlanta and bring Gabriel to live with my mom or my sister. And I, I had no idea I was signing up for a year long treatment. So I didn't know if I would see him again, but I had no idea I was going to be in the hospital for a year. That was quarantine. Anybody questions quarantine? Uh huh. Try sitting in the hospital, looking at four walls, separated from your then two-year-old son, crying on FaceTime, saying how many more sleeps, facing a 25% chance of survival and not knowing when you're going to get out and people are dying to the left and right of you. So when COVID hit, by the way, speaking of quarantine, I was like, you mean I can just sit in my house with my son who I begged more time for? Sure. Now, granted, I don't want to make light of COVID because I lost my father-in-law to COVID. I, I, we've lost so many people to COVID. So I'm not making light of that, but I'm, I felt like I was prepared when the pandemic hit because I'd been through so much loss and quarantine. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you could, you could be with those you love instead of being separated. Oh yeah. I was a veteran of that war. I was like, okay, I can tell you all what to do. I, I can mean, give you a year, a year. You have a two-year-old baby. That just breaks my heart because I can't imagine having to be away from my children for a was, year that you cannot touch your child. You cannot touch your child. You think about, I went from nursing him to not being able to hold him. And to this day, it, well, if he's ever listening, he would have a fit, but to this day, he sleeps next to me because he Aww. is traumatized. He is traumatized yeah, as well. I'm traumatized too. But I used to tell the doctors, if you don't, I mean, I had meltdowns and nervous breakdowns, which is why I push for psycho-oncology, like the mental side of cancer care, like humanizing it. Because I would scream like a lunatic and say, if you don't let me out of here, I'm going to pull the IV out because I'm going to die of a broken heart before I ever die of cancer. Let me out. And then they would have to, you know, give me the reality check. Like, listen, if you walk out, you are going to die. Like, there's a, and I said, yeah, and I'm, if I stay, I have only a 25% chance I'm going to die. So, so at least then you would be able to spend time with your son. And they, so they said, you have to put faith over fear and believe that you're going to be that 25%. And, and, and what, what, what was your, what were your days like when you're in this one year quarantine in a hospital room? A well, year. I, I, I can't I, wrap my brain around a year. 365 days. I tell you when they reunited me with him and then I'll go back to what the days were like. He walked past me like we had never met. Oh, oh, and I, cry. Fell, <laughs> I fell to the floor at Johns Hopkins crying like a lunatic. And, and I said, cause all the nurses would try to make me feel good. Say a, a, a baby never forgets his mom. They always, you know, he nursed with you. you babies, they never forget their moms. And when I walked out of the elevator, I put my arms out, sorry. Mm. And I squished down and he, he ran a completely right, different direction. Right past you. And I said, I thought they, and I yelled at the nurses. I was so angry, but they were my heroes. And I said, I thought you said he wasn't going to forget me. What happened? And they were, everybody was crying and I was, uh, I was a wreck. And they realized, you know, that, that, that I had such PTSD. I'm like, mm -hmm. how, how, how do I reconnect with my son? Like it was so Trump. And, and this was, first of all, I got to see him after 10 months because they thought my treatment was done. So they let me see him. And this is when he walked past me, but okay. then I signed up for a trial for a study to look deeper in my cells. So a day after I was home with him, which is worse, they called me and said, you have to come back because it's coming back and now you need a transplant. And I said, well, now what do I, like it, at that point I was so traumatized, like what we did to my son, make letting him see me and then take me away again. And this time they said, we need you for a hundred days. <gasps> and I thought, oh. I, I, I said, I, 
I don't even, I felt like at that point, I wanted to, I just said I wanted to die because I can't, I said, he just needs a better mom who could be here with him. Like I couldn't, I couldn't fathom how they let me see him. I mean, they were doing what was, what they felt was right at the time and then pulled him away. I mean, literally one day later after you. Yeah, I was at, home with him. I was at, at a bounce house in, um, I was living in Loudoun County. We were at a bounce. I took him to a bounce house with my N95 mask on trying to be that mom. I was exhausted, but I said, I'm going to take him and do what other moms do. And I got, I got a call and I looked at the zip, the area code. It was from Johns Hopkins and my heart sank. I thought, what could they possibly want? You were just there. <laughs> and it was my oncologist. And he said, I need you in my office tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. And I just dropped the phone and I was screaming. And I said, and he said, I said, no, I can't wait till 8 a.m. I need to know what's ha- what is happening. Mm-hmm. And he said, it's coming back. And if it's going to be a race against time, and if we can't get you a transplant in time, you're going to die. I ran through the bounce house, <laughs> climbing through to get him, put him in the car. I'm hysterical. He didn't even know who I was really. I mean, there was no affection, no hugging, no kiss. It was just, it was awful. He was like some, somebody else's kid. And then I had to find a neighbor because I hardly even knew my neighbors to take care of him until my husband could get him. And he had to check me back into the hospital. And then I needed a hundred. Where does your husband live at this point? Is he, had he, by then we had bought a house in Loudoun County. We had moved. Okay. Okay. So you, because you were able to come together. Yeah. We were going to be together. It was so traumatizing. And and at that time they told me, by the way, why don't you buy a Christmas tree? This was in October. I promise I'm going to get back to what happened. In <laughs> okay. the no worries. But they said, buy a Christmas tree and put it up and take pictures just so you, he has those memories of you. And I'm thinking like, you really think I'm going to die. Oh my and gosh. And so we, I ran. So the next day before I had to go back, I ran around, got a Christmas tree at Walmart at that time, seven years ago, they didn't have trees up so early, put, got a Christmas tree, took pictures with him. And then went back to the hospital for a hundred more days. Okay. So I have to ask, because what's puzzling me is they didn't have this figured out before you left. I mean, you had just left I had and just then left. you get this news. I mean, it seems like. No, uh, I had signed up for a clinical trial that looked deeper into the bone marrows and looked at what your cells are going to grow up to be. And now they're able to do some of these things, but this was seven years ago. So they could, the way they explained it to me in layman's terms, like you're saying, oh, you, this little cell is going to be a doctor and this is going to be a firefighter. And oh, this is going to be a cancer cell. And it became a race against time because with leukemia, if you come out of remission, they can't give you a transplant and then you don't. Oh, I see. The okay. Disease. The problem, which is why I advocate so much for diversity in clinical trials and diversity in the bone marrow donor registry. My sister was my only match, but everybody else in my hall who was not somebody of who wasn't a person of color for say I'm Cuban. All my friends who were Caucasian, they had four or five, six donors in Germany who could were perfect matches for them. I had one, my sister, nobody, and she had a heart murmur and had issues. So she had to pass all this rigorous testing. And if she didn't pass, I said, what will happen? So I had sat outside the room while my sister went through all this testing. And like running on a treadmill, testing her heart, testing her psychologically. Like, is she going to back out? Because people back out. And I said, well, what happens if she, if you don't pass her? And they said, you'll succumb to the disease and die. I'm thinking this is just so raw how they say it, but they, Very raw. they have to be transparent with patients. So at that moment, I thought I have got to add, I, my story is bigger than me. I've got to advocate for more diversity in the bone marrow donor list, more diversity in clinical trials. So when they treated me, when, and I'm gonna back up to how I was, when I was diagnosed, when they, when I came in, that even at Johns Hopkins, a world renowned institution said, hmm, CDP alpha, this and that, all your mutations. Well, we know how a German would do, but we don't know how a Cuban would do. We don't have any statistics. So we're gonna guess, they, but you're at a world-renowned institution where guessing involves a lot of high-level, brilliant, well-experienced people. So they kind of made their own little protocol and concoction, and thankfully that helped save my life. So, does, so are you saying that not enough people of certain ethnicities donate 
blood marrow, bone yes, marrow? The bone marrow donor registry is about okay. 70, somewhere between 70 and 76% white. Okay. And some of it's lack of trust, some of it for whatever reason. Why? But there's not enough minorities on the bone marrow donor registry. And it's doing a great disservice because you need a match. Yeah. And so, and now with my sister's bone marrow, which we can get into later, mm -hmm. they tell me that, oh, we wish we never gave you her marrow because she gave you back the cancer predisposition gene that caused your leukemia. So you're going to live every day fearing a shoe, the next shoe dropping. That's a whole nother story why yeah. I live with anxiety. But I want to get back to one thing. So if anyone's listening about when you go through trauma, what I found best, and not everyone works for a schedule, but I came from a career that was very structured and scheduled. So I knew when I got in there, I said, if I'm going to live and I'm going to live like the show survivor, but in this hospital room with bare walls. And if I'm going to live in this hospital room with bare walls away from my son, I need a schedule because I thrive off of schedules. So I literally took out a piece of paper and put like 7 a.m. walk, 8 a.m., research clinical trials, 9 a.m. we'll have rounds. And then 10 a.m. I'm going to work on scrapbooking in case I die. So my son has a book with all my little notes. So I made albums for him from 10 to 12. And then one o'clock walk, two o'clock call friends, three o'clock. So I, I literally gave myself a schedule because I needed a schedule so I would have a routine. Yeah. Otherwise I think you'd lose your mind. I, it was like, Yes, I had to have a schedule and I encourage anybody in the, on my hall, like you've got to create a schedule. You need a schedule. And then I realized we have to walk. We have to, I started researching about all the studies about improving patient outcomes and the more fit you are. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to, I know somebody is thinking this girl is ADD. Yes, I am <laughs> because I am all over the place. So if you want me to back up, I was diagnosed in January of 2014. I didn't get out of the hospital officially till Christmas day, like a Christmas miracle. So the 10 months into the treatment is when I got to see my son because they thought I was done. And that was in October. And then I went back for another 100 days. But during that time, when I felt like we were talking about how I felt like I was a fraud and what do I tell viewers, I said to my oncologist, listen, I'm going to be reporting from my bedside because I need to tell viewers what's going on in here. Like this story's bigger than me. I need to one, keep my mind busy. And two, I found so many voids. I mean, the system from a medical standpoint was brilliant. The doctors are amazing at Hopkins. But I said, even at a world renowned institution, they're missing the patient experience psycho-oncology, like the mental side, like there was no social worker type of help. I mean, they would come by for five minutes, like, how are you holding up? How do you, how the yeah, hell do you I'm, I'm great. Up? How are you? <laughs> the person next to me just passed away and, and they were walking with me yesterday. And, you know, the whole thing was traumatizing, but I asked my oncologist, what, what do I tell viewers who think I'm a fraud? Like, I thought that I had, I could eat this. And, you know, like I was saying, do this to avoid the very things like cancer. And what he said is, you know what, what you need to tell viewers is prehab, prehabilitation matters. That's how well you prepare your body for illness. And they said, so when I told my oncologist, I said, am I a fraud? Like, what do I tell viewers? And he said, you tell them that prehab matters. That's prehabilitation. And if you go into Google and you type prehab, it's going to autocorrect to rehab, okay. but it's prehab. And he said, bad things can still happen to you. The, the whole thing about you need, need to put your armor on. You're going to be away from your son for more than a year. And I was, that had me floored. And that's where I got the name armor up. For, I got an armor up for life so I could have my life. Mm -hmm. But when he went back into the prehab, he said, you need to tell your viewers that you prepared for this illness. It doesn't mean, he said, yes, you do have 25% chance of survival. It doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to survive. It means that you're going to have all 25. He said, I got the guy down the hall and this other person down the hall. They're not prepared. They've got too many comorbidities. I have to tiptoe around their illness, water down their dose. They should have 25% at most. And they show up unfit, not prepared. And they may have 10. He said, so you tell your viewers that you're not a fraud. What you are showing them is that, yes, maybe you can't avoid cancer, but you prepared yourself in the event you have to fight cancer. And so he really flipped the script on me and gave me the takeaways of what was the silver lining here is that I showed up fit. 
And and nobody talks about this really. I mean, you hear, oh, lose weight, exercise, but you aren't thinking about it in terms of something like this. And and in the industry that I'm in, we talk a lot about obesity and we were talking about COVID and the comorbidities of what would happen if you got COVID and if you're obese, the outcomes were much worse. Yeah, kind of a similar, but very different. No, no, it's true that the more baggage you have, the more difficult it is to fight something. Because I ask, when I, whenever I'm on stage, one of my last slides is how big, but what he told me is how you show up matters. And he said, if you have one message to get to viewers is telling them they need to get prepared today for what's going to happen tomorrow. Because yes, bad things can still happen to you. And how you show up to me matters. He said, you need to prepare for illness every single day. It's not about getting in the skinny jeans. It's not about how great you look, although that those are the, the side effects and the great benefits. It is how you prepare today will determine how well you present to your medical team when they say, how does the patient present? And ultimately that will help you position yourself to prevail. Are you going to get the strongest dose of chemo or the smallest dose of chemo? Are you going to have the 25% chance if that's all you have with that mutation, or are you going to just have 10? So I tell you what, I want all, if if all I have is 25%, I want all 25. That's not something I ever, I think following your story and having heard you speak about this before, it's something I it really was never in my consciousness that, oh, they're going to give you certain doses of these very toxic medicines. And if you're not strong enough to handle it, then you don't get the full dose. Right. I never really right. thought about that. Right. In fact, I now I'm on the, I'm now a caregiver because my sister is going through breast cancer and I know we're going to get to hit her story, but it still reminds me of the power of prehab, which mm-hmm. is the title of my book, Becoming the Story, The Power of Prehab. When I sit with her, she's going through breast cancer. We, she gets her blood work done. They check her vitals. They look and see how healthy she is. What are her counts? And then they actually go and send it to the lab where they customize and make her chemo based on her comorbidities. So how you present to your medical team is going to determine how strong your dose is. Mm-hmm. And it is critical. So I tell people and they're saying, well, I'll prepare later. I'm like, listen, you can say you're going to prepare tomorrow. Guess what? You're preparing today, whether you like it or not, with the choice, with what you eat, how much sleep you get, the stress and toxicity in your life, your, your financial stability, everything, all the, that stress, all those stressors and how well you, you're preparing every day with all the choices. And that determines how well you present. So then you could be better positioned to prevail. There's no guarantee, but it's sure. Don't you want a hundred percent of whatever that percent is? Increase your odds as best you can. Absolutely. Well, so let's go back to, you have to go back and then you find out you have to have a bone marrow transplant. And the only one that can do that for you is your sister. So you get the green light. So we got the green light. We had to go through a lot of vigorous testing. Like, and I sat out, I remember, I I, I talk about many times being in lunatic mode, sitting outside that door at Johns Hopkins while they tested her and talked to her psychologically, is she fit to be my donor? Physically, is she fit? And I'm sitting here praying going, she is my only chance. Mm -hmm. She is my only hope of living and watching my son grow up. And it was heartbreaking. Um, You know, when we put that Christmas tree up, Every year on October 16th, we put the Christmas tree up. No, And I said, if I live, that tree's going up every year on October 16th. Every once in a while, I get an eye roll from my husband. Like, are you kidding? I'm like, no, I'm not kidding. You wear your your team's jersey every winning, right? Yes. Put the damn tree up. (laughs) Get it (laughs) up up. there. (laughs) Put it up. I don't want any eye rolls. But so when we went through the transplant, it was going to be another 100 days. She came and she donated her bone marrow and it's, they, she had to have full anesthesia and they take like liters and liters of marrow out. And she was in the hospital for a few days, saving my life. And it, it it seemed almost like a blood transfusion, the way they hang it. It's just, you're like fully alert. You're getting the the transplant, the gift of life. And it's fascinating. But then, but then you can't be around, you can't be exposed to anything for the hundred days because you're you're suppressed, right? You're very immunosuppressed, right? Suppressed, but my insurance, even though we had great insurance, we're lucky to have insurance. 
they wouldn't cover for me to be in the hospital. I had to be in their Ronald McDonald house type attached to the hospital. So I had to find a hundred days of caregivers. Oh, I had strangers. I have never met come and stay with me because I said, listen, I don't care who your friend is. I just need someone with a pulse because they're going to turn me down because they want you on site. My insurance denied it. Who does that? And uh, that's a I whole other to, conversation. About I had to be right? on site. So I had to get different people to fly in and here I am immune compromised to help take care of me for the hundred days. Nevertheless, a lot of times people are, I mean, they cheer you on along the way, but they figured, yes, it's done. I'm like, yeah, but that's not the end of the journey. This is a whole new one. And how, so you have caretakers coming into your room. So how are you protected from your caregiver? Just doing no, the best. you're in a room with two twin beds and one sleeping in one room, one bed and one's in the other. And they're, you're attached to the hospital. And they really have to wheel you over. Wow. It's, it, the, I look back and I'm thinking, I, I know my, my doctor always says, how's my unicorn? How's my miracle? Because the journey, even after the transplant, Two, for two years, they don't know if you're going to live. So you're like, do I make memories in case I live, in case I die, resumes in case I live? You're, you're going through so much and you're traumatized. And so I always ask my oncologist, who else is having all these problems after transplant? Because I'm still having issues. I'm still getting blood work for too much red blood cells and so much. Thursday, I'm going. And he said, listen, they're not here. I don't know how else to tell you. They're not here but you are here. You're here. He said, people who've gone through and had as much chemo and radiation as you are not here. They did not make it for whatever reason. And so I'm grateful, but it does make me want to advocate more and get more answers about why things happen the way they do. But it, it has been one emotional journey, but I do know that through that whole process that I realized that the story was bigger than me. And I had covered the biggest story of my career was that prehab, prehab mm -hmm. mattered. And everybody needs to be out prehabbing. Well, we are all prehabbing, but everybody needs to take an active role in that prehab and getting fit. Like when I hear people say, I need a partner to go to the gym. I need a workout buddy. And I'm saying workout buddy. I like, I put my two feet on the ground. It reminds me I'm alive. And I work out because when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. Yes. And I say this because even after leukemia, I didn't kick back and be like, whoo, survive this. I'm not going to work out. Yeah. Now I can put my feet up. Just relax. Right, like I punched the time card for enough suffering for, I don't know how many people, but I did not stop pushing myself in the sense that I did my yoga. I did my meditation. I worked out and thank God I did. Because like you mentioned in, in the intro on the fifth anniversary, we put the tree up in October to celebrate my transplant. And I get a call that I had breast cancer. And I thought, you have got to be kidding me. No, how, like, how did they find that out? Well, I had probably eight months before that, I had like a lump and they, during one of my mammograms, and then they said, they did some biopsy and they said, oh, we don't think it's anything, but we're going to keep an eye on it. And then before I was so worried about it that six months later, I didn't wait. I said, I want another appointment because I, so I felt a little lump and they said it could just be fatty tissue. And I said, no, I want a 3D, which they'll do once you've had a problem, but I encourage mm -hmm. everyone to ask for 3D anyway. I, and I think they're old, doing them a lot more now, the 3Ds. Yeah. Oh, good, they should be. And then I asked for, I got the ultrasound and they, I remember it was, my son's school was having a Halloween party. So it was before Halloween, but he, they were having a Halloween party. And I said, I am not, you can do this biopsy. I am not missing his class party. I've missed so many memories with him. You're going to put an ice pack in my bra when you're done with this biopsy and pain or not, I'm going to his school. And so we did. And that was, I think like on a Wednesday and then Friday, we were still had this party planned to celebrate my fifth anniversary. And I was like, well, I can't, I'm not going to cancel the party because that's like bad omen. I'm just going to, we're just going to keep going. Like nothing's going on. And then oh I got the call. He's celebrating your five years and literally you're finding out you have cancer again. Yeah. That this is like hard to comprehend. I can only imagine what it was like for you. It was, I mean, I, I was, I was just more at a loss of words. I was devastated. And I, I just said, oh my gosh, like, what did I do? 
mm. to the universe. Back, and back started, to that. Mm. Back to yeah. that. I wanted to, you know, give the middle finger to the universe, like pissed off. Like, have I not done enough suffering? And again, sometimes I feel like some of us have to carry more weight than others. It does make us stronger, but I already know I'm strong. I don't need anything else, universe. <laughs> thank you very much. I, thank you. I've proven myself. I'm very confident with my skill level of being strong, but it really was shocking. And again, I realized that I was so grateful that I had prehabbed and I had stayed fit. Now I didn't look fit like I used to. And I always feel like I need some kind of banner or crawl like we have in the news, but to always say like, please excuse the mess I've undergone leukemia and a bone marrow transplant and they threw me into menopause overnight no my weight doesn't look the same and I struggle with my weight now but I worked out I never stopped working out I did whatever my limitations were well and thank thank god that you decided to go ahead and have that and it was the mammogram or the biopsy at the six months and not yes I didn't wait for them Self, self-advocacy, self self-advocacy. Yes, that's why I have the three P protocol, prepare, present, prevail. And then the fourth one's pain in the ass. That's <laughs> the unofficial P. Perseverance, pain in the ass, whatever you want to call it. I don't know if I can say that on your show, but- You can say it. <laughs> I can say it. Okay, good, good. So it's been some journey and it's been really hard, but I still have to advocate. The other thing I've told people is that I noticed when I'm out advocating for- the underserved or even people who just aren't as pushy. My sister's an introvert. She's, she's very well versed and does a lot of reading, but she's not pushy. Mm -hmm. And I think of other patients who may not be getting the answers they want. You have to be pushy. Well, because it's intimidating. Doctors can be very intimidating and very, they're busy. So they don't have necessarily the bedside manner or all this patience. Right, Right. But I learned that my connections mattered. And I keep saying you should not have to be connected to improve your patient outcome. Mm -hmm. But it worked for me. And I've said, I've got to, so that's something we're working with, with Armour for Life is to create a network for patients so they can be connected. Like, you don't, it doesn't matter where you come from, how much money you make, who you're connected. I want to connect people. And that's what we're working to do. So right now we don't have like an official platform, but people, we help navigate for patients. So if patients call Armour for Life, my nonprofit, we connect them to doctors. So if they can't get in with a certain doctor, we help make those phone calls for them. Oh, so that's phenomenal. Yeah. Because I, when I had breast cancer, they said, oh, it's not like leukemia. Cause I'm saying, what are you waiting for? Like it's all two weeks, three weeks. I should have chemo. And they're like, no, in breast cancer, you chase the scans. We got to make sure it didn't spread to your bones. We need a CT scan. We need this scan. And it was so baffling to me. And then when I needed surgery, they were like, oh, that's two, we're booked. It's going to be two months away. Two months. Good, yes. A good thing. I, and I knew somebody who was the head of a breast cancer organization and they called the, the plastic surgeon directly and said that I, they had somebody to see. And I was in that doctor's office the next day, the next day. So I said, I, I took the appointment, of course, but then I felt bad. Like you see, it really depends on who, you know, it's not just for jobs. It's really to save your own life. Yeah. Because if you don't know anybody, then you're just trying to work through the system as best you can. And working through the system is exhausting mm -hmm. and you the time is ticking. And sometimes so, you don't even know where to start. Right. Absolutely. So I was so blessed to get in with, with the right doctors in the right amount of time. I had surgery during COVID. Well, we didn't know it was COVID. It was January 3rd of 2020, but my surgery was going to be scheduled for March. Thank God we didn't wait. I, yes, because with, that's when COVID blew up in March. Right. Yeah. So we, I had five months of home health care because I have a delayed healing marker, three infections, two readmissions. I feel like I should say in a partridge in a pear tree, as I'm saying. but it was such a long journey. I advocated through that. I worked on my book. And I just kept helping other patients navigate because I said, this is really difficult times. And I felt like I was a veteran of the war that we were all embarking on. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward to now, I don't even know if, if that's one of your questions, but my, when I moved to Atlanta, my husband had a job opportunity for a company that would move to Atlanta. We, I moved here in advance of him. And my husband's like, oh, because you're going to have so much support from your family. And, and it's going to be great. And I got here 
my mom had laryngitis and I said, mom, you don't have laryngitis. She said, yes, my primary care says I have laryngitis. I said, you have throat cancer. Like oh, this has goodness. gone on more than two weeks. This is too long. Took her in, she had throat cancer. Now, then months, two months later, after being here, my sister has breast cancer. So it's, it's been a journey and I'm thankful to be advocating. Um, and, and I really think, you know, my 3P protocol seems to ring true at every phase, no matter what patient we're talking about, what cancer. Um, one thing that really stuck out that is always on one of my slides is my oncologist word saying, we can't kill you trying to save you. And I'll repeat that. We can't yes. kill you trying to save you. So that's why you have to be prepared every day because how you show up matters because they can't give you a chemo dose or whatever dose you're getting that's that you too can't handle. That you yeah. can't handle. So if you have comorbidities, you're overweight, hypertension, diabetes, and they have to give you half of that dose because they can't kill you in the process of trying to save you. Mm -hmm. And it's the most profound soundbite or statement that I carry with to every speech with me, because I really hope that people think about, I mean, we know we're not invincible. We've all been now through a pandemic. So if you haven't been through cancer, you've definitely been through the pandemic together, but I hope everyone takes a, a deep look at how they're living their lives. How are they prehabbing? Because we're all prehabbing. What, how much toxicity and stress is in your life? Or maybe you're checking off the diet and the exercise, which is so important. But if you're not checking off the sleep, the wheel will still fall off the bus. You need sleep to restore cells. I, I don't think people understand how important sleep is. There are so many studies now for so many different diseases, like even Alzheimer's and dementia, can, yes. not enough sleep can contribute to that. Of course, we know stress, but sleep, sleep is super There are important. studies, I wish I had it in front of me right now. I'm working on an advisory committee with the University of Texas. And there's a study that they have that they're, we're all working on is talking about how stress can promote tumor growth. And there are numerous studies. If you type in stress and tumor growth, you will see how it can promote tumor growth. So I keep telling people, if you're not doing any of that, get with the program because take an active role, be an equal partner in your own success. But if you are feeling like, hey, I'm doing everything. I fit in my skinny jeans and I'm doing my green drinks and I'm working out, but yet you're burning the candle at both ends and you're not taking time to recharge and land that plane and take a deep breath and you're not sleeping and you're constantly stressed, you're still causing harm to your body and you still are creating that environment to have tumor growth. Well, I wanna just touch on a couple more things in your story before we <laughs> wrap all this up. So DNA and heart disease. So those were two things that uh, were changed or were a factor in all of this. So share a little bit about that, Loriana. Yes. Yeah, so if you have my book, if you get my book in the introduction, I talk about, I make a comparison to Alice in Wonderland where she says, who in the world am I? Oh, that's a great puzzle. And I said, that's me. Like, I don't know who I am. And I'll explain why, because for one thing, when you come out of cancer, who you are is not who you, who you were for sure. But among all the losses, I lost my own DNA. I am now my sister's DNA. If you draw my blood, it says no evidence of patient. Oh, I have my, it's baffling. And my son is so baffling. <laughs> I, my son's like, so you could go commit a crime and get Tia Lisa in trouble. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> we could. but the truth is, you know, you go through so much loss and then they tell you, you're going to lose your DNA. Now your insurance won't cover genetics for your two DNAs, which is something I hope to continue to advocate for our rights to know what we're receiving. But I have my sister's DNA in my blood and my genetic DNA on my skin. So for instance, when I had breast cancer, they were like, we don't know who you are. I'm like, neither do I, that makes two of us. They would only cover one genetic testing. So they had to do the genetic testing on my skin. Okay. But with my sister, my leukemia oncologist said, I'm gonna test what she gave you from a leukemia standpoint because he could get that covered. And it turns out she gave me a genetic marker called CHIP. It's clonal hematopoiesis. It's this long, lengthy word that I've thankfully forgotten how to say. But what it means is I will absolutely get heart disease from her. It's the genetic marker guarantees you heart disease. And then you're in a certain 
amount times more likely to get blood cancer. So it's a blood cancer genetic marker. And they said, if she had that, if I had my transplant today, she would not qualify to be my donor. I said, but then I wouldn't be here. Right. And they said, well, they would have had to make an ethical decision of letting her do that because really she gave me the gift of life, but we don't know if it was the gift of, I mean, she gave me the gift of life and gift of time, but we don't know for how much. Mm -hmm. And so living on that edge of not knowing what this marker means and the other genetic markers that I don't know about, because it's not, I mean, she's, well, she's going through breast cancer, but when you have two DNAs, you don't know which one's impacting your life and how to move forward and how to protect yourself from what those markers are. Now you have seeds of destruction from both sides. Because this is really unknown territory. This is all new, right? It is unknown territory. So now I have a cardio oncologist. I'm on uh, medication for heart disease. I've never had any issues with my cholesterol. She always, she's always been very fit, but everything she's taking, I'm taking. In fact, I remember going to Hilton Head on vacation with my family after months after my transplant. And I called my oncologist in a panic and I had a rash all over. And I said, I have hives. I, and he's like, well, what did you eat? And I said, well, I had crab legs. And he said, well, is your sister allergic to crab legs? I said, yeah, he oh. said, well, you're allergic to crab legs. Oh my gosh. Wow. So, oh, but I never I used I, to be. Yeah. <laughs> but at least I have my sister to ask. I mean, the, the mm-hmm. other people who get their DNA from people from other countries or they have no way of contacting these people to find out. So at least I have her. But for me, when they told me about this genetic marker and that they may have hopefully cured me of my AML leukemia, but now they gave me back the marker that causes leukemia. And now I'm having to do their, what's called therapeutic phlebotomy because I have too much red blood cells, which is like polycythemia, which is a precursor to leukemia. It's very complicated, but every week, or every few weeks between, I feel like I live between fence posts or between blood draws because I don't know where it's going to send me. And for that reason, I make memories every day. And I, my son knows everything to me is about making a memory. We celebrate, I tell my husband all the time, we celebrate when someone turns 95 or someone turns 90 and or when someone has a wedding, but we need to make the celebrations for people, for all of us or people like me who, gone through so much trauma and are are really like living by a thread, those need to be just, we need to make them just as magical because none of us really know when our world's going to flip upside down. And so you think about it, we're, none of us are invincible and we need to put just as much energy into celebrating people's lives while they're here while they're here and not just when we have the celebration of life when they're not with us. Mm -hmm. Are you finding that you're able to do this? Yeah. I'm trying to make living in the, living in the moment, live in the moment. I mean, we've, we've had to do it on a shoestring budget because we went through all of our savings and we've had to, my, I mean, my husband got back up professionally after losing his job, taking care of me, but we've went through so much savings that you you know, you visualize and dream of a nice vacation and then you get out and you're like, well, we, we have so many bills. We can't afford a nice vacation. So we would go to like Hilton Head for a night or somewhere for two nights because, and then I would tell him, but you know what, you know, it's so crazy. We're, we've gone through so many different stages of broke. I mean, and I'm saying that not for sympathy because my husband has a, a good job now, but we're still trying to rebuild everything we blew on cancer. And people don't, I don't think people realize how devastating financially. If somebody somebody has a wedding or somebody's dying, we will, everybody finds money. Mm -hmm. I said, we need what, what I remember when I got out of the hospital and I said, we need to find money. Like, you know, we find money when people die. We need to find money when people live so they can go live and celebrate life. Like we, it was just a really tough time to think that he slept at my side, held down a job. And then he was reorged out of a job. He eventually landed on his feet and found another job, but the timing was certainly terrible. The the timing was terrible. And I really just feel that we need to put just as much energy into living our lives. So now we, we do little moments and we still feel guilty to spend 
even even if he's in a good place from a career standpoint, because we feel like, is there another shoe that's going to drop? But we do mm-hmm. make a point to make memories all the time. I love that. And I think something that COVID has taught us as well is that we didn't, we couldn't travel, we couldn't go places. So what could we do at home? What could we do that was local that, you know, getting back into nature and like you said, one night, one night stays at places. I mean, that can be just as wonderful, especially because yeah. you're with your son. And yeah. With your oh, we, we make memories. I mean, whether it's a golf cart ride, we live in a golfing community. Everything is a memory. And my son knows that. So we, we, I don't need a fancy vacation. I, I would love the beach all the time, <laughs> but we find ways to make memories. And it's so important that everybody finds time to do that, whether there are little moments or big moments, but you can't wait till like, Oh, let me have a big party when I turn 95. Cause guess what? You may not hit 95. How is your son Gabriel doing? How are you guys? He is, he's my sun, my moon, my stars, my world. He's doing good. I mean, he still struggle, struggles a lot with PTSD, just like I do. Mm-hmm. And he's been in therapy. I've been in therapy, but we are going through all of this together. And he knows that we're all about making memories. And he does worry that something's going to happen to me. Like I didn't tell him when I had breast cancer until after like months after the surgery. That is a, an emotional story. I'll tell you really quick because I know we're out okay. of time. But I didn't tell, I didn't want to tell him because I said, this kid cannot handle another cancer. Mm-hmm. So I told him, you feel this bump? I let him feel the bump. I said, mommy has to have it cut out. So I'm going to have surgery. And he said, okay. And so I had surgery. The surgery didn't go as well. Then I had a nurse at the house and this and that. So three months later, he had a bug bite on his leg. He just thought I had a bad surgery, you know, mm-hmm. like, cause I struggled. And then I put a little X mark in his leg where the bug bite was. I don't know if moms do that, but I do that. (laughs) And he said, mom, I didn't know you could do that. Like, you know what? I should have done that on your bump, on your boobie. And Uh then maybe you wouldn't have had to have surgery either. And then I cried and I said, honey, I have something to tell you. I had breast cancer. Mm. And he said, what? How come you didn't tell me? And then he was upset that I didn't tell him. But I said, I just, I wanted to live through the surgery first. Mm-hmm. And then it, I thought I'd tell you when I got out and then it was so traumatic going through it with all the home health care. So I wanted to wait till I was in a good place. And he said, so you waited for me to think it was a bug bite. So I did wait a little too long, but it was an interesting way to how I had to handle it because I didn't know how to talk about it with him, but he is my everything. And so whatever he wants to do anything, if I say, oh no, we can't do that. And he goes, we'll make memories. I'm like, okay, fine, (laughs) fine. We'll go. Smart smart kid. Smart kid. (laughs) Yeah. So all that trauma, so much trauma. So I'm so glad to hear that therapy, therapy for you, therapy for him, because that, that is a phenomenal amount of stuff to go through. I was wondering about that. And that's when you mentioned, what did you call it? it They call it psycho-oncology. It's an emerging field. But Mm -hmm. still, there's so much more work to do. I mean, Mm -hmm. in 2015, there was a law passed that you had to ask patients in cancer centers how they're feeling. Well, that's great. I'm feeling crazy. Um, Or they would have you like draw something to say, what, who's the president and draw something to make sure cognitively, like you can Mm -hmm. still hold a pencil and and that cognitively you could think. But I'm like, listen, I need much more than a, a little drawing and ask me what year it is. Like I need like big time therapy. And, um, so then when you go to look for a therapist, there's not a lot of people trained in cancer related PTSD or, you know, trauma and cancer. So finding somebody, they're like, well, I do trauma. I'm like, okay, but they don't know any, they don't, they're not familiar as much with cancer. Yeah. So, um, I'm hoping again, I'm giving a speech on PTSD in New York this year, and I'm hoping that that can shed light on how we can really come to the aid of patients and what patients need and, and what care teams and healthcare providers can do to support them. Because if patients are mentally in the game, we want to, if, if you can help us mentally get through it, we can stay in the game longer. And it's mm-hmm. a win-win for everyone because yeah. if mentally we're cracking, we're going to quit. Well, because you even told me earlier that there were times when you were like, I'm done. Oh yeah. Yeah. I went from living the life to fighting for my life, to wanting to take my own life because I was so lost and didn't know how to get back up. And I said, it shouldn't be that way. And I was connected. I had prehab. Mm -hmm. 
And so I don't know what other patients were doing if it was so bad for me. I, I, when we lived in Virginia, we had a carriage house. So we had a shared wall and I can't tell you how many times my neighbor, while my husband was working, would come over and say, are you okay? Cause I'd pound on the wall and have like a nervous breakdown beating on the wall, screaming because I was cracking and she would run over. I hardly knew her. We became very close after that. I said, I'm having a nervous breakdown. I can't, I don't know what to do with myself. Like I can't, I'm physically exhausted. I'm in a mind and body I don't recognize. My son hardly remembers me. I have lost my career, lost my hair, lost my DNA. My husband lost his job. And, you know, and living, in, and living in terror, right? Never living knowing in when terror, the other going to drop. Yeah. And then romantically, you, you lose your marriage in some way because you're too sick to have any sort of intimacy. Mm-hmm. You, and then you lose friends on the hall one by one that you were staying in touch with. They pass away. I said, I, I'm done. Like, this is too hard. Living was too hard. I was done. And so I had to build my own pit crew, as I say. And, and it's a shame that I had to build it, but I had tools in my toolkit, friends who were connected, who could say this person, I'll make calls for you. And so I, what I worry about is people who don't have those tools in their toolkit or friends in their network or that pit crew to build that support system for them. And so I really feel that through my advocacy, my goal is to help healthcare institutions have that support for patients because they shouldn't have to build it on their own. They shouldn't, they, they shouldn't. And I know you mentioned that your faith really helped get you through as well. Yes, my faith, faith over fear. And mm-hmm. uh, there were many times that I questioned it. And yes, when you're sitting there, you're gonna question your faith thinking. I remember saying, well, what happened to Paul? He's a Christian and he didn't live So you start to question things and Mm -hmm. wonder like, well, well, what do I need to say to God? And I remember praying, there's a huge Jesus statue at Johns Hopkins and I would wheel my little IV pole down there and I would pray at Jesus's feet. And I would just say, Jesus, if you say, I would start to negotiate, like, Mm -hmm. what do you need me to do? So I'd go home to my son. I know I can speak. I've been a speaker my entire career. What can I do to survive? And I would say, if you save my life, I will serve you and save, help save people for the rest of my life. And that became my, my mantra. And now when people ask me to speak, I'm like, I, listen, I'm serving like this. I'm good. This is my purpose. And I've never been more sure of my purpose, but my faith is what got me through is praying every day. I had friends, a friend of mine named Todd would call me every day to pray with me, Mm. um, and that's helpful because a lot of times people don't know what to say to cancer patients and mm-hmm. you can just call them and say, Hey, can I pray with you on FaceTime or send a text and say, I'm praying for you. No need to write back. But my faith got me through and I had to pull strength from that because that was the only way getting out of there. Yeah. And you, through all that you've been through, I mean, you are, you are changing things. You, oh. you are. Yeah. I mean, you've got your book, you're, you've got your platform to help people that the three P's and you're out I've, there speaking and, and I've addressed the, the FDA. Yeah. I've addressed the FDA. I'm getting involved in some policy again, like what are patients rights to know their, what DNA they're getting. And I help patients advocate, help connect them. So this is again, I say I, but through volunteers as well, through Armor for Life. And we're working on other programs to help get implemented and put into place, but I know it's the power of one. And if I can get on stage and that I can do with a speech and impact 300 decision makers in healthcare who can mm-hmm. go out and make it better for other patients, then I know I've made a difference because they stay in touch with me and they say, you know what, you've changed my life of how I do things in my job as a C exec, C-suite executive. You've changed my life of how we interact with our patients. And to get those messages are the are awesome. Engaging with patients is great too, but if I can reach the people who engage with them and help make bring change and also talk to people about prehabbing mm-hmm. before they ever walk through those doors, then I know I've done my job. Very powerful message. Loriana, I am in awe. I am just in oh. awe of you. I, I admire you. I cannot believe what you've been through. You're still standing. Thank you so much. I'm in awe and I'm just honored and privileged to be on your podcast. Oh gosh. Well, thank you. I, I, the stories are amazing and gosh, I'm, I will be praying for your sister. Thank you. And how's your mom? 
Is she doing okay? My mom is, she's doing fine. We won't really know about the, any growth for another, for the, I probably it will take a year if there's any growth that's going to come back. Okay. So every two months I take her to her appointment. They make sure around her vocal cords that there's been no growth, but she, my mom's doing fine. We'll know in the next year how everything's going well thank you and i think we'll have to have you back for another update yes let's do an update absolutely thank you so much oh gosh thank you loriana have a wonderful rest of your day you too thank you for joining us on unbreakable spirit to learn more about jennifer and her holistic weight loss approach visit her website at sevencompany.com that's the number seven company.com and please join us for our next episode where we'll hear from more women who overcame hardship and learned how to thrive.